Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Welcome to Three New Guys. I'm glad you're here. Um, I don't really think about the <coughs> say tonight. I haven't spoke. Well, actually, the last time I spoke was here in April, so it was, it was recently. Um, it's good to be here. It's good to be at a meeting. Um, my sobriety day is September 26, 2007. Um, I've been coming to the room since 99, so about 20 years or so, most of that time been sober. It's my third time being sober, so relapse is part of my story. Um, I don't look bad upon that. Um, I'm glad I was able to come. I came here when I was 24 years old. It's difficult to get sober when you're that age. Um, and, uh, I didn't quite know what I wanted. And, uh, it's getting sober for other people these days. Like last time I came around, I got sober for myself. And, um, let me see. So yeah, so sober in my 12th year, uh, worked the steps. I got a sponsor. Uh, I'm working with one guy right now. My home group is a men's single topic. Uh, on Tuesday nights, it's a men's group at 8 p.m. and um, on MacArthur in Oakland. Um, let me see, that's all the stats. Uh, 44, <laughs> <laughs> separated. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Um, things are good. Um, I, I don't know if I want to talk so much about the drunk log. I, I drank a lot. I smoked crystal meth. Um, Try to do that responsibly. That just basically means you're an addict. Like no, no one does crystal meth responsibly. You know. I, uh, the, this last time I came in, um, I was drinking every day, and I thought it was one of those yets. It, it hadn't happened to me um, uh, the previous times I was drinking, where I'd be drinking every day and I couldn't stop drinking. And this was, and I was drinking, I don't know, 18, 24 beers a day. That's a lot. That's not normal. Um, and then like I physically couldn't stop drinking. Um, so, uh, yeah, I broke down one night and I, I called an old sponsor of mine at like 2.30 AM and I'm like, what do I do? And he's like, Just go to a meeting. I mean, <laughs> you know the deal. So, uh, I got this first time I got sober, I went to rehab and that, um, that helped so much. I, I still, so that was 20 years ago and, um, I still remember all the lessons from there for the most part. It's amazing. And then uh, after coming back to the first meeting, it's a meeting of the Berkeley Fellowship. I fucking hate the Berkeley Fellowship. But uh, <laughs> I realized that it's one meeting. It's not indicative of the whole program or Alcoholics Anonymous. So the next thing I did, next day I went to, uh, went to Rockridge Fellowship. And it was, it was more my, uh, my pace, my speed. And I ended up going there for the 9 a.m. for like two years straight. And that's where I got sober this time. Um, Alcoholics Anonymous has been, it's been the best thing I've had in my life. Um, it's where I met some of my best friends. Um, it's the only reason why I'm able to be a father these days. Um, I'm able to have had relationships, have relationships. Um, it's been, it's been the best thing for me. And I don't know, it's, my life is not turned out the way I thought it was going to be. I, I had this certain plan, how it was going to work out. And none of these plans worked out the way. I didn't end up getting the job I wanted to get. I didn't end up going to college and getting the degree I wanted to get. None of that worked out, but things have worked out, and it's been a strange, strange trip. And it, it's it's been great. I, I've, uh, I, I, I don't know. I mean, that's this. I think the common theme of my sobriety has just been kind of not having a black and white thinking. I had this very, like, things are going to be this way or that way, and that's not how things worked out. They, I had to be flexible. Um, like, today I had this I had this plan today. I was going to go look for a washer-dryer. I ended up going with one of my best friends to fucking Livermore. It's the mall outlet. And, uh, <laughs> that was uh, kind of excruciating, but I got, to spend, I got to spend the day with one of my best friends and just shoot the shit with him, and it was, it was great. Um, it was just, it was, it was fun. I haven't hung out with him and it's been too long, maybe a month or so. And, uh, just, just really good catching up. And, uh, that's been, that's just like, you can extrapolate that. That's been my life for the, the last 12 years or so. Things, plans not go as I wanted them to go. They went a different way, but they worked out okay. Um, I've got a, I've got a job that, um, it's not perfect, but it's the best job I've ever had. I work with people I like. 
they, they tolerate me there. They haven't fired me in seven years, so that's good. <laughs> I sit on my ass for eight hours a day, and I'm not doing busting my busting my hands doing manual labor, which I've done in the years past, and I, I'm glad about that. Um, I've got I've got a house. I've been um, uh, I moved into a, a new place, a really little house, just me and my dog, and it, it's nice. It's it's a different it's a different setting than I had a few years ago, and I I don't know. I split up with my wife around right around the end of last year, you know, I didn't know what the hell was going to happen. You know, I didn't know if I could stay in the area, if I could afford to stay in the area, how I was going to be able to uh, pay child support or how the whole thing was going to work out, you know, and things just worked out. I, I just, I showed up, kept coming to meetings, kept talking to my friends, talking to my sponsor, talk with her, we worked things out. Um, and it's just, it's things that have just been a blessing. And, like, uh, opportunities have opened up that I didn't think were going to be possible, you know. I didn't think I'd be able to afford to stay in the area. And stuff just, it just happened. Just from showing up and doing a little bit of work and not knowing what the hell to do, but asking people for their advice and showing up the next day and doing a little bit of more work, a little bit more work, and things have worked out. I don't know. I'm being really vague, but um, <laughs> um, I don't know. I mean, the... Things are things are okay today. That's been the cash and prizes for me. My life is it's okay. I got to do yard work this afternoon, and I I got to trim this huge damn English walnut tree, and it's just it, it was great. It's just like it's great to like my yard is a fucking disaster, but like it's just it, I get to work on it. it's my yard. It, it's just it's it's a really it's a cool experience. I don't know. It's just um, I don't know. It, it's nice to it's nice to take care of something, and it just. I don't know. And this is, that's why I'm here tonight. I'm taking care of like, taking care of my life. I'm taking care of tomorrow's hike up so I can show up for my daughter when she comes back from camping. I don't, I'm not a jerk to her. I'm not a jerk to my ex-wife. Um, it's really good to be here. Welcome to the three new guys. And welcome to anyone else. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. My name's Gil. I'm a recovered alcoholic. Hi, Gil. Hey, Gil. Hey, Gil. everybody. Um, my sobriety date is November 17th, 1982. I have been clean and sober over 36 years. And the single most important thing I can say about that entire period, I didn't drink today. You know, I can't change anything that I did yesterday, the day before, before that. You know, All I have is today. It's uh, when I first got here. My first sponsor said, it's a daily program. It's a day at a time. You just don't drink today. And I'm like, so I can't drink for the rest of my life. He says, no, we just don't drink today. I said, right. So I do that today, and then I do it again tomorrow, and I do it the day after, so I just can't drink for the rest of my life, right? He says, we just don't drink today. I can get all caught up in future tripping, or for beating myself up for what happened in the past. And what I love about the program is it has helped me figure out how to live just in today. Um, by not drinking today, I have an opportunity to look at my past with a, with a clear eye and, and think, okay, is there anything there I want to repeat? Is there anything there I do not want to repeat? You know. When I first got here, my first sponsor said, he said, today you have a choice. And I thought he meant, I have a choice whether I pick up a drink or I don't pick up a drink. And that was like the single most important thing in front of me. It was like, it was the, the elephant in the room. How do I not drink today? Come to find out, I get to choose an awful lot. I don't get to choose the what, but what I get to choose is my relationship to what happens. Um, I'm pretty sure I grew up in an alcoholic home. It wasn't your typical people getting drunk, passing out at inappropriate moments kind of alcoholic home. It was more dad would get home from work and mom and dad would open up the gallon of screw top burgundy um, and start <laughs> sipping, you know, a small glass of wine. But the glass was never more than half empty, and they were topping it off all night long. So they were just, and this was every single night. And I can remember 
years later, years into the program, talking with, with uh, one of my sisters and saying, yeah, you know, the, the, the folks, they, they weren't really alcoholic. And my sister gave me this funny look. She said, you know, when we would come home from school and mom would be on the couch taking a nap <laughs> after having visited for coffee with the lady across the street. I'm like, oh. But the wine was a constant theme. And I remember my first drink. I was five years old. And the parents decided that my sister and I could have a very small glass of wine with the Sunday dinner. And I thought this was great. I get to do this adult thing. My entire life, I've always wanted to feel different than I do now. You know, when I was a kid, I didn't like how I felt. And I thought maybe if I was a grown-up, things would feel better. And I wanted to do the grown-up things. Um, and I was in a hurry to be a grown-up. And so here's this rite of passage. We're having this little tiny glass of wine. And like I remember picking it up, and I'm all excited, and I took that first sip. And it was some of the nastiest shit I ever put in my mouth. I mean, it wasn't grape Kool-Aid. Like, I expected it to be sweet and all of that. It was just this sour, bitter. And I swallowed it. And then I felt it. I felt it go through my arms. I felt it down my torso. And I remember that feeling. And I was like, wow, this is magic. And I looked over at my sister's glass. And I thought, if she doesn't drink hers, I will. <laughs> so to recap, I am five years old. <laughs> I have had one sip of wine. And I'm already thinking ahead to the next drink. I used to wonder, when did I become an alcoholic? I was born one. I was born with a body that you put alcohol in it, and all my body wants is more. I don't have an off switch. If I'm conscious, and there's alcohol, and I've been drinking, I will continue to drink. And I have been told this happens when I'm unconscious as well. Proverbial blackout. It's just... Um, Friends have told me, you know, at the time they were funny stories because I didn't remember them and we're kids and we laugh at all sorts of calamities with each other. Um, but I didn't start drinking on my own until I was 12. Uh, it was the summer between sixth grade and seventh grade. And I wanted to be one of the cool kids. I, I never made it, you know, but I wanted to be. I wanted to be. I was more of a nerdy kid. Uh, I was not athletic. I looked like toothpicks held together with elbows and knees. Um, I was gawky, uncoordinated, uh, and I had a mouth, you know, and bad combination. <laughs> but I picked up drinking, smoking, and drugs all in the same weekend. Um, a buddy of mine stole a bottle from his dad. Uh, and we ran off to some field to start drinking it and introduced me to cigarettes then, which, you know, I probably coughed and coughed, uh, wound up face down in a muddy ditch, passed out. And my drinking kind of went downhill from there. Um, I chased it. I chased it. I wasn't a daily drinker. But I looked forward to drinking. It's like, when can we drink again? You know, how do we get more alcohol? And and this was back, the, the laws were a little more lax back when, when I was drinking. Um, you know, we, we would stand outside the, the deli or the liquor store and find someone who would buy us beer or wine or, or a bottle of something. Uh, and it's amazing how many people were willing to do this for 12, 13, 14-year-old kids, you know? Uh, they'd buy us cigarettes, they'd buy us booze, whatever. Um, and we thought this was great. We're doing this adult thing, like I said. I loved the feeling. All I wanted was more. It helped me escape. I am a comfort-seeking missile. If I don't like how I'm feeling, and I think something's going to help me feel different, better, 
I will make a beeline for it, and I will do a lot of it. One of my favorite things that I've heard around the program is if I could drink without messing up my life, I'd do it all the time. <laughs> you know, but that's not me. I can't drink without messing up my life. Um, ran away from home. Um, it was an abusive environment, and I finally just said, the hell with this, age 14, I ran away from... I would rather live in the streets and take my chances there uh, than go home at night. I felt safer, at least in the streets. I felt like somebody had my back, uh, joined a street gang. Um, we didn't fight that much. I mean, we had a rival street gang. This isn't suburban Long Island, by the way. This is not, you know, <laughs> this isn't in the mean streets. Oh, okay, this is a little safe white neighborhood. We had like two street, street gangs, you know. And most of the time what it was is we're standing on one corner and they're standing on the other corner and we're telling them all about themselves and they're telling us, oh, and we're going to do this and they're going to do that. And, you know, after about 20 minutes of this, we kind of got bored so we'd like walk away. Yeah, we really told them. And I'm, I'm pretty sure they walked walked away saying, yeah, we really told them, and we'd drink, because that's what it was. It was about being together with a bunch of guys and drinking. Um, age 17, and I remember this clear as a bell. I'm in the park with the buddies. We're starting to drink. It's the middle of the afternoon, and a thought passed through my head, and it may as well have been a voice. It was that clear. It said, your drinking is off the charts, even compared to your friends. You might be an alcoholic. And that rattled me. That's not my thought. 17 years old, my thought is, yeah, we're drinking. But I didn't recognize at the time that this was a power greater than myself trying to get my attention trying to ask me at age 17, what do you think, you know? But it did, it rattled me to a point that I actually went up to one of the older guys um, and said, Randy, i worried about my drinking, I, like I might be an alcoholic. And he thought about it for a second. He puts this brotherly arm around my shoulder. He says, you know what, Gil, you can't be an alcoholic because you drink like I do, and I'm not an alcoholic. <laughs> The thing is, that's the answer I wanted, you know, because if Randy had said, dude, you're right, let's get you to a detox, I'd have been, whoa, whoa, not, let's not be hasty, you know, and I'd have gone and asked somebody else, and I would have gone and asked as many people as necessary until I got the permission that I was looking for, the permission just to keep drinking. I wanted to feel like the drinking was okay, when in fact it really wasn't. You know, even at 17, my life was starting to slide downhill. I was getting into trouble with alcohol. So the obvious solution was to get married. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and have a kid. Yeah. You know, and get the house. Yeah and get the car, and get the furniture, and get the dog, and get the cat, you know, because my entire life, this is what I was told a life well lived looks like, when you have these things. And all of them worked for a minute, you know? You get that initial thrill when you meet someone, you know, and the relationship is kind of good, except, you know, I was alcoholic, you know, I didn't stand a chance. She was alcoholic, didn't stand a chance. Um, but we tried, it didn't work out. Um, so I figured maybe I didn't do it right. And I got married a second time. <laughs> and moved from New York up to New Hampshire because that was the problem, you know? New York was just killing me, because New Hampshire was going to be so much better. New Hampshire was like this huge step backwards. It was like going back in time 10 years. Um, that didn't really fit there. But I had a cure for not really fitting. I would drink, you know, and I always found the places to drink 
where people were drinking. Um, I used to tell myself I was a social drinker because I would drink with people and we'd be having conversations. But actually what it is, we'd be like spewing words back and forth to each other <laughs> um, just for something to do between sips. You know, <laughs> we weren't exchanging any real information. We weren't solving the world's problems, although maybe at the time we thought we were, you know, and there was this, there was this sense of camaraderie, but it was kind of a false camaraderie because if I wasn't there drinking, they didn't come out looking for, oh, geez, we can't start drinking yet. Gil's not here. Let's go get him, you know, kind of thing. It's just, um, Drank my way out of that marriage as well. Um, moved down to Cambridge, Massachusetts, and my life just really started circling the drain at that point. I had a kid down in New York. I had a kid up in New Hampshire. I'm trying to keep up support payments to both. I'm trying to keep up visitation with both. Um, and I was drinking a lot. I was drinking a lot more because, you know, I've got all this failure in my life and I don't feel good about it, but I don't want to really think about it. I just want to escape my feelings. And drugs and alcohol did that for me. Um, so the obvious solution was to get in another relationship. <laughs> I used relationships the same way I use alcohol and drugs. You know, and gummy bears. It's just, I can't eat gummy bears in safety. It's just, you know, I don't care how big the bag is, it's one serving. <laughs> Before there was the internet, if you wanted to find someone randomly, you had to put an ad in the back of a paper, and you got like 20 words to describe yourself and your ideal partner. So I pick up one of these papers, and I'm scanning the ads, and I sent out, oh, the thing is you had to write a letter, put it in an envelope with the <laughs> box number of the ad, put that in another envelope, mail it to the newspaper, who would then, you know, send it off to the recipient who may or may not then get back. It's like, you know, you guys got it easy today with OkCupid and shit like that. You can get this instant gratification kind of thing, you know. Um, had to wait. <laughs> I sent six letters off. The thing that I remember about each one of those ads is they kind of, they specified they were interested in someone who is either a light social or non-drinker. And I figured at a six-pack and a quarter Jack Daniels a day, I was light social. <laughs> a a six-pack and a quarter Jack Daniels by myself, I was light social. Three people actually got back to me, you know, and then you have phone conversations kind of thing. Um, two of them agreed to meet me. The first one fled in terror within 30 seconds of seeing me. <laughs> The second one invited me over to dinner. I was nervous. I was really nervous about this. It was November 17th, 1982. I was visiting a friend up in New Hampshire, helping them out with something. Driving back home to get ready for the date that afternoon, I thought, I need a couple of beers to calm my nerves. So I stopped at the, the package store, packies, they call them up there, liquor store, got two cans of beer, and finished the second can just as I pulled up in front of the liquor store by my house, <laughs> where I bought a pint of Yukon Jack and a six-pack of Budweiser 16-ounce beers, telling myself I'm going to have one, maybe two beers, a couple of pulls off the bottle, by the time I was ready for the date, it was all gone. It was all gone. It was there was no in fact I'd even drained the corner. You know, you know how you know how you got the, the yeah, you all know what I'm talking about. The bottle's been sitting there for about five minutes and you tip it over and there's that little corner and it's just like you know. 
You know how you can tell the difference between a social drinker, a problem drinker, and an alcoholic? Put a shot in front of them. And then take a dead fly and put it on top of the shot. The social drink will be like, get that away from me. You know, give me a fresh shot. Problem drinker will flick the fly off, drink the shot. The alcoholic will pick up the fly, squeeze it out. <laughs> that was me. I used to wake up in the morning, pick up a can next to the bed, shake it to see if there was any liquid in it. If there was, drain it, spit out the cigarette butt, <laughs> and swallow. I have, since getting sober, lost the desire to drink anything a cigarette butt has been put out in. <laughs> I show up for the date, and the only thing that kept me upright was the door, <laughs> like this. And she looks at me and she says, you're drunk. I don't know how she figured that out. <laughs> but she didn't kick me out. She, she fed me dinner. I told her my tale of woe, which I now call my drunk Um <laughs> But it was mostly about the rotten deal that life had dealt me, how hard my life is. No, nobody, nobody gave me a break, you know. Uh, everybody was out to do me dirty. Um, then she's just nodding her head through all of it. And after dinner, she's like, you know, it seems like it doesn't matter where you live or what your job is or who you hang out with. The situation keeps repeating itself. And maybe if you saw a counselor, they could help you see how you might have a part in recreating this pattern again and again. Sometimes I can guess the right answer. And I'm like, okay. Because <laughs> I figure if I don't say yes, she's not going to agree to see me again. So I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll do that. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure who I'll call. She says, I have a number. <laughs> oh, well, oh, thank you very much. I'll take that. I'll call when I get home. She said, you can use my phone. <laughs> I go, well, they're not in the office right now. She said, you can leave a message. <laughs> I called. I left a message. Um, and then as I was leaving, it's the first time she mentioned my drinking. She said, and while you're at it, why don't you think about your drinking? And I walked home. It was an early, early winter that year. Um, I was dressed pretty much like I am now, but with a suit jacket, a uh, sport coat. When I got home, I was numb. And I didn't know if I was numb because I'd been out in the cold for so long or because I had so much alcohol in me. And I had another one of those white light moments. It was. It was as if a light went on. All the lights were on in my house. Um, and that voice, that thought, that crystal clear thought went through my head. And this time it said, it, it didn't ask if I thought. I was. It said, you need to quit drinking. You need to go to AA. And the light went out. And it rattled me. Again, this is not my thought. There was nothing left to drink in the house. I'd finished it all before the date. And I woke up the next morning, and, and, and I'm kind of shaking. And, but I still remembered this, this thing from the voice. So back then we had this thing called a telephone book. <laughs> you know, it was about this thick, had numbers for everybody who had a telephone. And you actually had to pay money not to be in the book. Um, and AA is very easy to find in this book. <laughs> it's in alphabetical order. And I called Central Office in Boston, and a very patient individual read me the entire meeting list for Wednesday in Boston. I'm like, nope, don't want to go there. Nope, don't like that one. Nope, nope. I'd never been to any of these meetings, <laughs> but they were all in churches. And I wasn't going to church. I'd had enough of church. You know, I'd had enough of people trying to jam God down my throat. You know, the Ten Commandments, either obey these or you're going to hell. I'm like, fuck, I'll go to hell. You know, it's easier. Uh, and I said, 
Thanks. I'll call again tomorrow. She said, well, we can send someone to pick. I know the hard sell when I hear it. I just hung up. You know? And this is back even before you could star 69 someone to see whether, you know. Um, and I don't know. For some reason, I didn't drink that day. I felt sick, deathly ill, kind of shaking. And I did. I called again the next day, and another very patient individual repeated the process for Thursday, reading me the entire thing, and again, I didn't go. And Friday, I called again. I had really had a rough night. I didn't realize that I could have died, um, shaking it out alone in my room with the bugs crawling all over me. You know, the magical bugs that automatically disappear when you turn the light on. Um, no, no drugs to help ease any of it. I didn't realize that, that I was in the DTs. I just knew I felt like shit and probably couldn't have made it out to the liquor store if I tried. Um, Friday, again, running through this whole list, and I'm thinking to myself, i got to pick one. Da, da, da. I said, okay, I'll go to that one. And the name of the church was Our Lady of Pity. <laughs> and that's what caught my attention. So I went to my first meeting at Our Lady of Pity Church in uh, Somerville, Massachusetts. I got there late because, you know, I had to get ready. I put on my cleanest, dirty shirt, <laughs> you know, kind of straightened out my oily, greasy hair, um, walked into the meeting, you know, and there's a guy standing up at the front talking about what it's like to be drunk. I already know what it's like to be drunk, so I stopped listening to him. And then I smelled it, the coffee, you know. I hadn't had a cup of coffee in a couple of days. God, I wanted a cup of coffee. It just, oh, I, you know, as, as badly as I wanted a glass of wine, a beer, anything, I wanted. And so I, like, made a pass, tried to do it surreptitiously, you know, sneak past the coffee table. Everybody's sitting down. The guy's standing up looking around, and I think I'm sneaking around. And I'm looking, and I couldn't figure out where you put the money, how you paid for the coffee. I didn't want to just take a cup because the guy is standing there. He's got a direct sight line to the pot, and I'm just afraid that if I did, hey, you didn't pay for that. Put that back, you know, because that's... So So I took my shaking self, and I went and I sat down. Um, meetings back there were an hour and a half long. There was a break in the middle of the meeting. Um, and apparently I got there just before the break, as I'm sitting down and da, 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 and they called a break, and I'm thinking, okay, that's enough for my first meeting. And I'm getting ready to leave. And, and this big guy uh, is blocking my way. You know, I'm trying to get around him, and he's just not letting me through the door. And he sticks out his hand. He said, welcome. You're new. And it wasn't a question. <laughs> and I'm like, all right, I'll cop to being new if you tell me how you figured it out. He said, two things gave you away. One, you're the only person in the room that doesn't have a cup of coffee. He says, you wait right here. I will get you a cup of coffee. This guy's my new best friend. He brought me back a cup of coffee. It was half a cup of coffee. It was like, I call it newcomer coffee. Extra light with 100 sugars. You know? <laughs> and the reason he brought me half a cup is because I'm, I'm like this. You know, holding the coffee. And like this way, I'm not going to spill it on myself. And he brought me cookies. You know, it's just like, wow, this is great. So I'm eating the cookies. I'm drinking the coffee. I'm not I, I'm not leaving now for some reason. And I'm like, what was the second thing that gave me away? He said, oh, you're sitting in the beginner's seat. So I looked at where I was sitting, and there's no sign that says beginners sit here. I said, what makes this the beginner's seat? He said, oh, that's the one furthest and back closest to the door. <laughs> and then he did something remarkable. He reached into his back pocket, and he took out his own personal copy of the meeting list for the Boston area, wrote his number on the front page, opened it up to Saturday, circled a meeting, and said, I'm going to be here tomorrow night. Why don't you meet me there? I hadn't been invited any place in a long time. You know, I'm like, okay. <laughs> he said, and try not to drink between now and then. You know, see what you can do about not drinking between now and then. Okay. 
And I don't know what happened, but I went. And he was there. And I walked up. I'm like, hi. And he's like, oh, yeah, you. And he's standing next to this other guy. And he says, what meeting do you go to on Sunday? And took my meeting list book. And he circled a meeting. These men passed me from person to person, circling a meeting every night. I had not, I not only had a series of meetings that I could go to, I had people who were willing to say hello to me at each of these meetings. I felt connected. I felt wanted. I felt welcomed. And I hadn't felt that in a very, very long time, and I wanted more of it. I eventually found a group that was my home group, and I'd heard talk about getting a sponsor. I had no idea what a sponsor was, you know. I thought a sponsor was somebody who sat you down, grilled you thoroughly, uh, and then dragged you up in front of a tribunal and said, all right, you know, I, 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 I vetted this guy, and I'd like to propose him for membership in our August body of, you know. And what I heard at this meeting was a sponsor is somebody who has something you want. So I walked up to the prettiest girl in the room, <laughs> and I literally asked her to be my sponsor, and she just got the merriest glint in her eye, because she knew what my shit was all about. And she says, yeah, we kind of go guys with guys and gals with gals here. And I took my disappointed self, and I turned around, and there was this guy who I'd heard speak at the meeting. And I still remember to this day what he said. He said, my name is Al Mack, and I'm an alcoholic. Let me tell you how I started. Let me tell you how, share with you how I spent my day. I woke up this morning, I got out of bed, and I asked a power greater than myself to keep me sober. I went downstairs, I made myself a good breakfast, got ready for work. On my way to work, I thought about what meeting am I going to tonight? Because any day that I know what meeting I'm going to that night, there isn't much that can happen during that day that's going to affect me so badly that I'm going to need to pick up a drink before I get to that meeting. And here I am at the meeting, he says. And if I manage to make it home without stopping at the liquor store for something to drink, he said, I'm going to thank that power greater than myself for one more day of sobriety. And I thought, this guy's a turkey. I'm going to fuck with him. So I asked him to be my sponsor. That man saved my life, you know. We couldn't have been more different. I was a long-haired, liberal, hippie type. He enlisted to fight the war in Vietnam. Um, I was liberal. He was conservative. But he told me, when I, when I talk with the guys that I sponsor now, the things that come out of my mouth are the things that this man told me in the first couple of months of sobriety. Um, today you have a choice. Um, told me, you need to find a power greater than yourself. He said, we're here to build a defense against taking the first drink. But you need to find a power greater than yourself for when, not if, when, the urge to drink strikes. He said, alcohol is a power greater than you are. You start drinking, alcohol owns you. You don't, you don't have a say in the matter after that. So you're going to need to face it. And I don't care what it is. It could be the group of people. It could be the God of your childhood. He said, it could be a doorknob. He says, long as it's not you. And like I said, I'm fucking with the guy. So I thought, all right. And I took an empty Coke can. And I put it on a shelf in my room, and I'm having a conversation out loud with the Coke can, saying, you are my higher power, you are responsible for keeping me sober. This way I could report back to my sponsor that I now had a higher power, <coughs> literally <coughs> higher. <laughs> the thing is, every morning that I woke up, the first thing my eyes landed on was that empty Coke can. And the very first thought that went through my head was, oh yeah, I'm going to try not drinking today. In a very real sense, it worked. Because again, that's not my thought. You're going to try not drinking today. My thought is, I'm fucking with the world, you know. I 
fought doing the steps. Three and a half years until I did a fourth step. I was in a world of hurt for three and a half years because I didn't have my medication, the alcohol, the drugs to help with what I was feeling. But I also didn't have a plan for living. And I didn't realize that the reason I want to drink so much is I am creating situations in my life that are so horrible, I want to escape them. It was so bad that people would literally introduce me, this is Gil, he hasn't done his fourth step yet, <laughs> as a way to explain what you were about to witness in my behavior. Yes, yes. I was feral. I was angry. I was mean. Um, I was a rageaholic. And eventually I hurt so badly that I said, fine, I'll do a fourth step. And my sponsor said, great, start with your list of resentments. <laughs> that was easy. Oh, no, actually, it wasn't. No, no, no. What happened was I had called him up. That's right. This is even better. I called him up, again, complaining about something. Somebody had done me horrible, and I was pissed off. And wah, wah, wah. He said, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. He says, I'm on my way out with my wife to dinner, but I want to talk to you about this. So do me a favor. Write it down so you don't forget it. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, I'm not going to forget it. He said, no, promise me you'll write it down for me. Do it for me that you will write it down. I'm like, okay, fine, because, I, again, I can guess the right answer sometimes. He said, while you're at it, if you can think of anything else you're pissed off about, write that down, too. <laughs> but once the pen hit the paper, I was off to the races. So I go show up for my fourth step, and I have all my lists, and I have all this stuff written down. He says, where do you want to start? I says, my resentments. He said, of course. He says, go. So I read off the first resentment. I'm getting ready to blast through the second. He said, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. He said, so so-and-so did this. I said, yeah. He's like, so what was your part in it? I looked at him like he had two heads. It's obvious what my part was. I'm the victim. <laughs> He's like, oh, this is going to take longer than I thought. The relief that I found on the other side of the fifth step. I mean, I'd heard the relief, that all the relief I'm looking for, that I was ever looking for in a bottle, is in the steps. And when I finally experienced it, it was like, wow, this is great, you know. Come up on the ninth step, scared to death. My first amends went well. And the relief was palpable. They didn't all go well. There were some people who were like, fuck you, get the hell out of here. But the thing is, the amends process, my, my, my sponsor said, he said, a good amends is accompanied by an apology, but an apology is not an amends. An amend is a change, like the amendments to the Constitution. They're not the apologies that we have a Constitution. They're the changes that make the Constitution a stronger document. He says, it doesn't matter whether anybody accepts your amends. Your job is to live your amends. So for the last 36 years, I have been living the steps to the best of my ability. Not perfect. I love the 10th step where it says when we were wrong. Not if, by some odd happenstance, I find myself wrong. When we are wrong. It lets me be human. The steps allow me to be human. The only punishment for not doing the steps is the life that I subsequently live as a result of it. I have a life today I wouldn't trade. Um, I have been self-employed for quite some time in, in, a, in something that it provides a service to my community. Um, and I'm edging towards retirement. And, and I'm trying to figure out what does my retirement look like. Um, I went through a major surgery. I lost the use of my right arm. And I managed to get through it without wanting to escape into the poor me's. Oh, how do I get dressed? How do I mean, the questions came up. How do I put on a shirt? How do I open a can of cat food? How do I wash the other armpit? Um, <laughs> but not in any poor me sense, you know, just like the mechanics of living. Like, how do I live this? Yes, I'm uncomfortable, but I want to live sober. I want to live clear headed because I have a faith today 
a faith that a power greater than myself is guiding me, a faith that if I practice the principles in the 12 steps, I will have a life that I don't want to escape from living. And, and that's been the case. Even with some of the biggest mistakes that I have made that have hurt other people badly, I let myself feel the feelings, let myself feel the consequences, because if I try to escape the consequences, I won't learn the lesson. You know, um, I tell people now I've been sober long enough that I don't, I don't have to work the steps. I get to live them. You know, I don't have to do anything. Nobody has to do anything. But every bit of relief, like I said, that I was looking for in the bottle, in drugs, in relationships, in gummy bears, is in the steps. I'm grateful the program exists. I'm grateful for every single person who's ever stuck their hand out to me and made me feel welcome. I'm grateful for the people that I sponsor uh, because those people keep me in the steps. Because as I'm walking them through the steps, I'm going through the steps again myself. And as I'm telling them why they probably don't want to drink, I'm reminding myself why I probably don't want to drink. Now, here's the thing. Since the surgery in 2000, I have not been comfortable in my body. I have a constant state of discomfort. It's like pins and needles running down this arm now. I have some of the use of the arm back. It's great. But when I'm working with someone, I forget I'm uncomfortable. <clears throat> Standing up here talking to you for 40 minutes, I have had 40 minutes of relief from this feeling of discomfort. Nothing has physically changed except I'm not focused on me. I'm focused outside of myself on what can I do for somebody else. Um, that's a miracle. That is an absolute miracle. There are so many miracles in this program. They used to say, don't leave before the miracle. You know, you don't want to leave five minutes before the miracle shows up in your life. I want to welcome the new people. Um, 36 years is kind of hard to comprehend when you're, you're, you know, you're sitting there with your first couple of days of sobriety. But, but talk to somebody else. Talk to people who have got a couple of months, a couple of years. Uh, or even come up and talk to me. Uh, I'll tell you how I did it, you know. 36 years sober, all I have to do is deal with today. Today's been a really good day. I want to thank Lache for asking me to speak and the group for allowing me to be of service tonight. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.